Happy Sabbath, Auburn. Uh, today's scripture reading comes from John 19, 16 through 19, and it says, Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away, and he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side of him, and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. We've been told in the book Desire of Ages, page 83, that it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in the contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. And as we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. It's my prayer that uh, that's what we'll do now in the process of communion. I'm going to kneel down and pray one more time, if you bow your heads with me. Lord God, what more deep and powerful theme can we meditate on than your death? As we, as we contemplate the power of your death, Lord, I pray that we'll see a fresh, a new today, the power of what you've done for us and your sacrifice. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to be celebrating communion. And, and really, communion is celebrating Christ's sacrifice. And so what I wanted to do is just read through these passages of Christ dying on the cross. Um, because that's, that's what we're here to celebrate, what he has given to us. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 32 through 33, we see the words that was already read. And as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. And they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There's a couple of important concepts which I gain from these verses. The verse starts with, as they went out, as they went out. That, 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 uh, that's a key idea, the idea that they went out. Jesus was taken outside of the city to be killed. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, the Bible says, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. It's amazing that, that the sign upon his cross said, King of the Jews. <laughs> Yet he wasn't enthroned in the city. He was enthroned with the crown of thorns outside the city to be taken out to a place of wicked people. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. See, Jesus taking our sin upon him took that curse. And because he took that curse and he became the cursed one, there was only one place where he, he could be and that was outside. Outside. Outside of the love of God the Father. <laughs> Because he became sin, outside of the city, and outside rejected by his people. The other thing that grasped my mind from the previous verse that we read about Simon of Cyrene being taken is this idea of the weight of the cross. You know, we like to meditate on the concept that, that Jesus Christ just couldn't physically carry the cross. And that's true. It was a weight for him. 
But it was more than a, a physical weight upon Jesus. It was, more than, it was more than the fact that his physical body could not carry it. It's that spiritually, emotionally, mentally, he could not go on. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32, um, once again says, if it'll let me, and I need, might need to use the clicker. We'll see. Okay. Mm. Okay. Matthew 27, verse 32 and 33. And as they went out, they found the man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the skull. And so here, they, they just grabbed a passerby. The reality is that they couldn't grab any old, ordinary Jew because it was the time of, um, it was the time of Passover. And if, and if a Jew touched the cross of a criminal, they would be excluded from participating in Passover. So no Jew would help him. Not even his own disciples were allowed to go and touch Jesus' cross. And so they just grabbed some random foreigner, Simon of Cyrene, somebody who did not claim to be a follower of Jesus. Somebody who was just walking through, and as they saw the, the people taunting him and ridiculing him, saying, hey, get back up, carry your cross, and, and beating him, Simon, they could see the, this look on his face like, what are they doing to this man? And because they saw on this passerby's face a little bit of pity for Jesus, they said, oh, you have pity, do you? Carry his cross. And they forced him to bear that emblem of shame. Desire of Ages talks a little bit about the physical experience of Jesus Christ. It says, since the Passover supper with his disciples, he, Jesus, had taken neither food nor drink. He had agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane, in conflict with satanic agencies. He had endured the anguish of the betrayal and had seen his disciples forsake him and flee. He had been taken to Annas, then to Caiaphas, and then to Pilate. From Pilate, he had been taken to Herod, and then sent back to Pilate. From insult to renewed insult, from mockery to mockery, twice tortured by the scourge. That means he received the 39 stripes twice. All that night, there had been scene after scene of a character to try the soul of man to the utmost. Christ had not failed. He had spoken no word, but that tended to glorify God. All through the disgraceful farce of a trial, he had borne himself with firmness and dignity. But when after the second scourging, the cross was laid upon him, human nature could bear no more. And he fell fainting beneath the burden. <laughs> physical, his physical power, he could not move on. He hadn't eaten. He hadn't drank. He'd been violently abused twice. He, he had, his back was completely lacerated. He was bleeding, not just from the crown of thorns on his forehead, but because he was sweating blood. And when they placed the cross upon him, it's not that he was unwilling, it's that he, his body would not move anymore. He could not carry the weight of the cross. The thieves beside him had no problem carrying theirs. They hadn't gone through what he had gone through. And, and as he's walking through the streets, barely able to carry his own body weight, there he sees the crying women. The Bible says, And there followed him a great multitude of people and of women, who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it's dry? There he saw women crying for him. And though he perhaps was thankful for that small amount of pity, he said, don't cry for me, cry for yourselves. If humanity is willing to kill God, to what length will they go? To what length will they go? And, and he foresees in, in his mind's eye, not just the scenes of now, but the fall of Jerusalem, where many of those exact women will be hurt 
Some will die. And in his mind's eye, he goes to the, to the end of the world where if this is what it's like for one single man to experience the second death, what will happen when, when God's wrath and, and his mercy his mercy no longer is shown to the human race. And when he comes and, and the people cry out for the rocks to fall on them. He says, yes, this is horrible. But don't think of me. Think of the future. Think of yourselves. There we see the crowd pressed around Jesus. It's interesting because if you think about it, it, would o- it was only a few days earlier when the same crowd, the same people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the, king of, to the son of David. And only just a few days later were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. The same people who said, who, who carried palm branches were the same ones that said, he healed others, but he can't heal himself. Come down from the cross. And it tells you the, the, the wretchedness of peer pressure. The, this, the disgusting distastefulness of, of, of humans that are just going along with the flow. I ponder, you know, the fact that today it's kind of easy to love Jesus. <laughs> it's kind of easy and it's normal. It's normal to say Hosanna to the son of David today, especially in the Bible Belt where most of our friends think similarly. It's easy. But, but I ask myself, how will I stand when the crowd is not with me? <laughs> how will I stand when, when everybody else is saying crucify him, crucify him? Will I be there also? Or even his disciples were there, but they uttered not a word. And most of them fled. And then we come to the moment where they actually get to Golgotha and Jesus is nailed to the cross. It says in John 19 verse 18, there they crucified him. With, they crucified him and and with him, two others, one on either side, and Jesus between. <clears throat> you know, it was intended purposefully by the Jewish leaders to put Jesus between two thieves. It was a statement about Jesus. He is a wicked man. We put him in the midst of wickedness. This is what we think of him. But, but if you think about it, it's a powerful, actual prophetic statement that he was placed in the midst of sinners. Because that means that Jesus can stand in the midst of us. (laughs) A Savior that comes in between the sinners. And I imagine uh, the thieves on on, on either side as as they began to try to nail the thieves to the cross. That they wrestled and they fought, but they held them down and hammered nails through their flesh. But as Jesus lay on the cross, he laid there silently. I know that he laid there silently. Because the word of God says in Isaiah 53, like a lamb led to the slaughter is silent. Jesus did not murmur. And I ponder, I ponder the, the mind of Mary. I mean, can you imagine? We know for the story says that she was there. This is her son. And if you have a child, <laughs> to imagine the concept of seeing your your child abusively executed in front of your eyes. That, that's got to be one of the, the most painful experiences. In fact, it, it reminds me of that moment. You know, Gabriel told Mary that she's going to be uh, impregnated by the Holy One and, and, that, and, and that the Holy Spirit's going to fill her with, with uh, pregnancy and, and, and it's going to be this wonderful thing and it's going to save save his people from their sins, but, but the angel also said one thing further. No, this wasn't the angel. This was Simeon whenever they took Jesus to be dedicated, whenever he was only eight days old in the sanctuary. Simeon made a prophecy, and he said, a sword will pierce your own soul also to Mary. And she didn't understand the depth of what that meant until this very day when she, her own heart was crucified with her sons. What she wouldn't give to switch positions with him and, 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 and all the questions that not just her, 
the mother of Jesus, but the disciples were asking, like, I thought this was the one who would save Israel. Not just the fact that he's dying, but the fact that, that in their understanding of the Messiah, it's as if all of their dreams are being dashed. I want to read that passage about everybody else making comments, some ridicule, some comments of lack of faith, and yet what did Jesus say? He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. There was no please stop as they nailed him. There was no, it's not fair. I'm innocent. There were hardly screams of agony. Just a silent victim with drops of blood forming everywhere. But what was he thinking? I mean, what was going through the mind of Christ as he's being abused and tortured and ridiculed and pierced? What could possibly be going through his mind? The scripture is clear. <laughs> There's only one word he said as he was being nailed to the cross. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What is he thinking? The eternal Savior is only thinking of the salvation of others. <laughs> That's what he's thinking of. He's thinking not for, please stop this pain, but he's thinking about the man who's nailing him saying, please forgive this man. He doesn't know what he's doing. Please forgive those who are yelling ridicules at me. Please forgive those who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. They don't understand. And now, when you think about verses like, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, wow, now we have a greater depth of meaning. Like, what was, can we have that mind? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Let this mind be in you, the Bible says. I, I suggest that there's no harder thing in the world <laughs> than to let this mind be in you. This is harder than all things which the world seeks after. This is harder than being a millionaire. <laughs> this is harder than achieving great success. This is harder than having the most greatest fitness. This is harder than, than, than having the greatest social connections or being a super connector. This is the hardest thing in the universe. Let this mind. when we're abused and ridiculed, <laughs> when our own thoughts are maligned and people tell lies and we're betrayed by our closest friends, let this mind be in you. That's big. Christ had pity for all. Even those who willfully attacked him. It wasn't just for the centurion. <laughs> By the way, if you think about the comment, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, that comment wasn't just for the centurion. It was not just for the Romans. It was not just for the Jewish leaders. Because if you think about it, who is it that killed Jesus? He died for my sins. He died for your sins. So who killed Jesus? We did. I did. And so Jesus is, is saying, Father, forgive them. And, and that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a promise for me. Father, forgive them. They killed me with their sins. They didn't know what they were doing. And then we see the sign that's placed, nailed on top of the cross above Jesus' head. It, it was actually uh, common and typical for them to write the crime for which this person was being killed. I'm sure that the thieves above their heads had a sign, thief. 
But above Jesus' head, the sign was unique. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. What a profound truth. (laughs) He was being killed for what? Being King of the Jews? And the Jews were angry. They said, no, that's not, don't, don't write that. Please write, he said that he was king of the Jews. And, and, and Pilate, just angry at himself that he already gave in to them to, to, to murder an innocent man, says to them, what I've written, I've written. But if you think about it, in the story where Pilate says to them, don't you want me to free this man? He, he's your king. And they say, no, he's not our king. We have no king but Caesar. They rejected him. They claimed that Caesar was their king. And they claimed that if anybody else claims to be their king, this is the result. They said their Messiah is Caesar. They claimed the world to be their God. And they rejected the one who was supposed to be. Killed for being the king. What has the world come to? And as you think about all the taunts and the ridicule that they hurled at him, just listen to some of it. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of of God, if he is the chosen one. And, And again, they said, the soldiers mocked him coming up and, and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Everybody seemed to be joining in. The thieves on either side of him mocked him. The Jewish leaders mocked him. The Roman soldiers mocked him. But it's interesting that of all the mockery, there was one key word. If. It's the word if. And it should sound very familiar because it's the exact same word that Satan came to him with in the temptations in the desert, if you be the Son of God. You see, you have to get this. This wasn't just some innocent mockery. Satan was in the crowd. And Satan wasn't finished yet. He knew that if Jesus went through with all of this, it was the end of him. But he knew that if he could just get Jesus to say, oh yeah, oh yeah, I will come off the cross then. If he could just get Jesus to do that, he would not fail. This was probably one of the greatest temptations of Jesus on that day. The greatest temptation was not to withstand pain. One of the greatest temptations was to to not say, okay, well, then I'll show you. I will come off the cross, and I will show you what you deserve. As the ridicules were levied against Christ, it was a satanic frenzy whispering into every human ear that day. Use your power. Come off the cross, Jesus. Are you really God? And amongst all of that, amongst all of that rabble, there was just one hope. Among all of the pain, the agony, the abuse, the ridicule, there was one single moment of joy that Jesus experienced on that cross. Amongst the seemingly hopeless, hopelessness of the Jews' mockery and the, and the Roman abuse and, and the disciples' lack of faith, And the thieves' ridicule is one of those thieves suddenly changed his mind. One of the criminals who were hanging railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save, Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, we indeed justly, For we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. In the midst of all of that, Jesus was given one joy. That one person recognized Christ for who he is. His mother crying and confused. His disciples thinking it's over. The Jews gleaming because they achieved what they wanted. And the Romans just looking to see who's going to win the garment. But one man amongst them all, the the least likely, you might say, 
The one who was condemned to die. The one who deserved it. The one who had nothing else to live for. Was the one that came to faith. In Jesus bruised, mocked, and hanging upon the cross, he sees the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And hope is mingled with anguish in his voice as the helpless, dying soul casts himself upon the Savior. And he says these simple words, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's just one thing that remains. One single thing. You know, they took everything from Jesus. They took everything. They took his clothes. They took his friends. They took his life. They took everything. But there's one thing they could not take from him. And that was the power to forgive sin. He was still God. He was still God. He chose to remain on that cross. But they could not remove from him the power to forgive a broken sinner. That was the one thing that remained. And in the darkness of that moment, somebody saw the light. Somebody was saved. Most, though all of us were saved through this, most that day did not experience salvation. One man did. One. And if you think about the darkness, the Bible says in Luke uh, chapter 23, verse 44, it was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. It's as if nature itself could not watch. The Bible says, if these people don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. And in that moment, the rocks were crying out. Clouds darkened. Nature could not watch. The universe was turning its face. As the people were saying, yeah, kill him. But really... What was being hid more than anything was the Father's face. Why? Because Jesus was dying the second death. The second death is simple. It is the removal of grace. It is the removal of grace. And the Father was not allowed to share, to shine his face of grace upon his Son as he died. Desire of Ages... um, has this powerful quote, the guilt of every descendant of Adam pressed upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure became because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, in the terrible weight of guilt, he bears. He cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of of the divine countenance from the Savior in the hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. We, we like to think about how Jesus was, was bleeding, how he was, how he was hurt physically, and the things he had to go through physically. That was nothing. The thing that killed Jesus is that his father turned away, and Jesus died because of it. Jesus had never experienced life without the grace of the Father. In fact, let me go farther. You and I have never experienced life without the grace of the Father. The only ones who ever experience life without the grace of the Father is Jesus Christ and those who will perish in hell. That is the second death. The Bible says, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Shortly after, he finally dies. In Luke 23, 46, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Or or as John records it, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
This is the most profound, the most profound statements that could be written <laughs> on paper. That God died for me. That God died for you. He did it all for you. Communion is all about this. Communion, this, this experience of taking the bread and taking the wine, this is an opportunity to celebrate the fact that Jesus did that for me. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. There's, no, there's, there's nothing fair about this. It's just this opportunity. We say, thank you. You're offering me communion, unity with the Father, even though I don't deserve it. I deserve to be the thief on the cross that died without grace. But you come and you offer me grace in the midst of my brokenness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. With that, I'm not sure if there's any guests here today, but I'll just uh, clarify a couple of details. At the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we practice open communion. That means if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you're old enough to understand the depth of what it means that he has died for you, you, you can participate in communion here. It doesn't matter uh, any other details. If you are young enough that you've not been baptized yet, then you don't understand that yet. <laughs> and so communion is not for you. Um, communion is for you to observe, meditate, and to think about um, until you're able to make that decision for yourself in baptism. Uh, at this time, what we do as a Seventh Adventist church is we separate and wash each other's feet. That's what Jesus did in the Last Supper. Before the, la the last time that he was able to be with his, his 12, he washed their feet. This is a heart preparation for us. It's a symbol of God cleansing us and us being willing to serve one another in humility. And so what we do is we separate now. Um, we have a group if you want to go with just men. We have a group if you want to go as families and a group you want to go with just ladies. The ladies will be downstairs. Um, the families, if you go down the hallway this way, uh, you'll, you just, you'll see a dead end and a corner goes to the right. But if you turn left, that's the room for families. If you go down the hallway and then turn right and keep going, you'll see a room there for men. And if you want to uh, go with the ladies, just keep following the hallway all the way downstairs. <clears throat> We're going to separate and do the foot washing at this time, and then we'll partake of the emblems. Uh, let us pray before we separate. Lord God, thank you so much for what you've done for us. Thank you for this short moments that we've had to, to meditate and to take it each uh, detail, to meditate on each detail of what you've done for us. Lord, may this, may this uh, profound experience of your death for us continue to change our lives day by day. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll separate at this time.